So when my son was in middle school, his favorite game was StarCraft, which is something I mostly thought was great, except when it got in the way of sleep or when it got in the way of homework. Uh, so one night, he's sitting in front of his computer. He's not playing StarCraft, but it's definitely not homework either. Uh, and it's getting close to his bedtime, so I do the, hey, what's up? What are you working on? Uh, and he says, oh, I'm reading StarCraft fan fiction. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. And I kind of reined in my impulse to yell at him to do his homework. And I let him read his fan fiction. And I saw that he had printed out the story. And uh, at bedtime, he you know, took these sheets of paper up to bed with him. And so I walk in a few minutes later to sit on his bed and ask him what, how his day was, what is he reading. And I say, so what's the story? And he says, oh, I just finished Diary of a Zergling. And he looks a little sad. And he said it was sort of, if you, for those of you who know StarCraft, the Zerglings are sort of the foot soldiers of the Zerg race. And uh, he said the last entry was just that he was going to the front lines and then the story ended. Uh, and, you know, he was sort of, it had clearly given him a new perspective on this game that he was totally obsessed with. And then we talked a little bit more, and what I found was really interesting was he said, oh, and mom, we're studying about war and armies in school and history class. And he was building these connections between the story, a game that he was obsessed with, and what he was learning in school. And so that moment really stayed with me because you know, I had really had to hold back and sort of worrying about the homework that I knew wasn't getting done that night. But it was a really great example of when you give kids a little bit of space to explore um, that is grounded in a passion or an interest that they can build these very profound connections to learning that we as educators or as parents probably think is really valuable for kids. Uh, so this happened, uh, you know, um, a few years after I had wrapped up the study that the MacArthur Foundation had funded. Uh, we were with, it was a big group of uh, researchers looking at how young people were engaging with games, social media, mobile media. At that time, if you remember back then when MySpace was really hot and kids were on instant messenger and adults were kind of freaked out about what uh, teens were doing on the internet. Uh, and what we found, not surprising for those of you in this room, is that young people were learning a ton with their engagement with gaming, with online fandoms, with social media, mobile media, digital video production tools, all those things that were heating up at the time. Uh, and uh, we were um, increasingly sort of puzzling over how we could connect and kind of harness that in enthusiasm and engagement that kids had over the new technology, social networks, video games, and connect them to the things that educators care about, uh, civic engagement, academic learning, career advancement, and so on. Uh, so, oh, the, so the Connected Learning uh, Research Network was really founded to investigate those issues. Now, the other thing that we found in the digital use study that was really important was not only were kids learning a ton, but there was a huge intergenerational disconnect in how kids versus grown-ups viewed the value of these kinds of digital student-centered engagements. And this is a headline from you know, the paper up in Northern California around our study, which really, I think, captures the, the moment, which was that the grown-ups were really panicked, the kids were having a ball, uh, and there, Despite the fact that today, you know, older folks are on Facebook, maybe even on Instagram, and kind of and watch YouTube, uh, there's still this persistent sense that even though it might be valuable for me, when young people are on YouTube or Facebook or Dota, whatever it might be, it's a waste of time. And that divide is very, very resilient in the culture. And it's... Um, this sort of culture clash or this intergenerational animosity around new media 
is happening tragically and somewhat ironically right at the moment that there's this absolute abundance of opportunity in terms of young people being able to find information, to connect with specialized interests, to connect with communities of interest. And part of the reason for that is not only you know, the mistrust we have of young people uh, and their ability to make wise choices, but the disconnect, which is a longstanding one between learning in school and out of school, uh, between formal and informal learning. Uh, and what's happening now is you're seeing this sort of perfect storm where uh, not only is the technology feeding the kind of intergenerational tension and panic, but we're seeing these um, institutions of schooling, like this one, like this room, this auditorium, that were built in a very different era when uh, access to information, to specialists and knowledge really did require certain kinds of formats, certain kind of institutions uh, for people to gain access to versus today's free-flowing uh, environment where of demand-driven, anytime, anywhere, access to knowledge. Uh, and so, yeah, the tension, the intergenerational tensions, the tension between in-school, out-of-school, this is nothing new, but the world outside of the classroom has changed so dramatically. Um, I think the, uh, so I think this is really the, the big question that has animated my work and I think has been central to some of the issues that this community has been grappling with over the years as well. Uh, so I'm curious, I would love to just take the temperature of the group a little bit and how you're feeling about how today's technologies are intersecting with our work, with the organizations we work with, with learning. Uh, if you could show me with your thumbs, uh, how do you feel about how your company, your organization, your nonprofit school, wherever you're working, is really um, you know, embracing today's uh, network ecosystem in a positive and productive way for youth or for your, if, if you don't serve youth for your um, beneficiaries. Where thumbs up is we're killing it, thumbs down is not so much, and sideways is uh, maybe a little bit of both. Okay, there's a really mixed <laughs> response, but a lot of thumbs up. How about uh, the question framed in terms of young people? Do you feel young people today are smarter, better, faster, doing great, uh, distracted, can't read, and antisocial, whereas it kind of depends? <laughs> oh, interesting. I think there's a lot more sideways for youth than with the organization, so you all must work in pretty, pretty great places. Um, yeah, so the, <laughs> so the question, uh, I want to engage in for the time we have here together is really what can we do uh, to bridge this divide and this disconnect? And so the way that I've grappled with this question uh, is one through research. So we've continued to do research around uh, young people's digital media engagements. And on the, as a follow-on to the digital youth work, uh, Katie Salen, who I know you heard from uh, yesterday and I have been leading a project called the Leveling Up Project, which is just wrapping up. Our book is coming out in the fall. We're super excited, uh, which is specifically a series of case studies of youth online affinity networks that we chose very selectively and intentionally around uh, affinity networks that were very youth driven, but also had really positive learning dynamics. So. Uh, you know, great peer learning, you know, reputation schemes that rewarded good citizenship and good work. Uh, and importantly, they were all environments where there were learning outcomes or connections to academic, civic, or uh, career relevant learning that educators and grownups would recognize as valuable. Um, in this, we were motivated by uh, the positive deviance methodology that comes from public health, where they go into communities and uh, they first talk to people and try to identify individuals or families who are thriving, given the same resources that everybody else in the community has. And they elevate those existing practices from the community rather than you know, sitting on the outside and airlifting solutions that were designed by other people. So we did a similar thing where we knew that young people were already doing amazing things and learning amazing things online. So let's find those young people, let's find those communities, understand how they work to see if we can learn for that from them, connect from them better. So 
since you all are games people, I am going to challenge you to look at, for just a few minutes, an affinity network that is quite different. Uh, girl fans of the band One Direction, how many of you know One Direction? So if you think games are a stigmatized interest, I have to say, across the different youth interest areas we looked at, probably boy band fandom is the most stigmatized, at least as, uh, as far as the, what the wider culture views of them. Um, I mean, and we looked at professional wrestling fans, we looked at gaming fans, we looked at knitters, but yeah, One Direction fandom is the thing that is most likely to get eye rolls from teachers when we mention it. So uh, Ksenia Korbkova, who is a graduate student in our uh, team, did a study on the Directioners, uh, One Direction fans who are active on the online publishing platform Wattpad. And what she found was that it was this amazing community where girls were going online, not just girls, but mostly girls, were going online to connect with one another, to be able to just like fangirl out openly and enthusiastically with other fans, and it was a safe space for them to really perform that identity. Along the way, uh, they were reading hundreds of pages of fan fiction, writing fan fiction, doing things, giving feedback, doing things that previously they only did for English class, but they were doing it for fun on the internet. Uh, they were also talking about some identity shifts related to their identity as a writer. So this quote I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I'm not really a writer. I just write silly stories. A writer is a serious person sitting at their desk, typing on a typewriter, drinking coffee till late at night. And then he kind of steps back and says, he says, wait, but maybe I am one. Uh, so this is happening at the same time that these kids don't tell their parents and teachers that they're doing this at all. So this girl says, 80% of my class, girls in my class are on Wattpad, and none of the teachers know. And we're sort of pushing them, like, why don't you tell your teachers? And they're like, oh, they wouldn't get it. And again, the stigma associated with the interest is so high that for the most part, these girls uh, keep it pretty secret. Uh, so. The interesting thing that we find in these affinity networks is that they're bonding with each other around shared interests, but they're also supporting each other in their learning. And the, some of the friendships, the kinds of supports that they're gaining are really profound. So here's an example of, from a girl who says that, you know, I met my first true friend on Wattpad, and this was in the context of doing a collaborative writing project. She's uh, four years older, so there's a lot of this near peer mentorship that's happening, uh, and she's really nice. So this kind of relationship, this relationship that she has to an older girl is what I've been calling a learning hero, a personal relationship, somebody you have a personal relationship with who supports your learning, um, introduces you to something new, helps you go deeper into an area of interest, encourages you, gives you feedback and mentorship. And we all have learning heroes in all areas of life. Uh, it can be a parent, it can be a friend, it could be a teacher, it could even be an author who inspired you. Uh, if you look back on when you were learning something new, um, getting better at something you already loved, you can probably think of um, you know, several uh, many people in your lives who are there for you uh, who may or may not have been a formal uh, educator or mentor. Uh, so I wanted to, again, you know, just to pull a little bit uh, from those of you here in the room, if we could j take just one minute, if you could think about, like, who pops in your head when you think of a learning hero that had an influence in your life? If we could take just one minute, turn to somebody next to you, or I think we also have the ability to capture these tweets on a tweet wall with the hashtag learning hero. Um, who is one learning hero in your life that had an influence? Maybe one minute, just 30 seconds each, if you could share with a partner. <laughs> you can share with me. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can do it. Yeah.
Okay, maybe we can start coming back together. Uh, do a quick share back if you haven't switched. So I'd love a show of hands. How many people named uh, a friend or a colleague as a learning hero? Okay, decent smattering. How about a parent or other adult guardian? Okay. Uh, coach, mentor, and in informal learning kinds of settings? A few. Uh, how about a teacher? Okay, the teachers always win. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but you get a sense of sort of, yes, educators are the ones who are tasked as professionals to perform this role for young people, but really learning heroes exist in all aspects of our lives. Uh, so let's take it back to gaming for a little bit. When we talk to uh, gamers about who their learning heroes were, of course their friends, their peers, their practice partners were sort of the bedrock of how they learned to play and get better. Uh, and it was interesting the role that parents played. For the most part, similar with the, what we saw with the directioners, uh, parents were largely absent, indifferent, and often hostile to their kids' pastimes. Uh, and, uh, you know, they generally, at best, they gave them space to play. Mostly they thought it was a waste of time, but there were some exceptions. And so Alex, uh, who's the young person quoted here, was a really nice example of a family that, you know, had clear rules and boundaries. He was a very successful student. He wasn't allowed to game during the week, but on the weekend, it's like, that's your time. Uh, and they not only let him play, but they obviously kind of respected that it was you know, not a waste of time, not something that was rotting his brain. And the mom even went so far to you know, think of it just as another thing that boys did together. So they would have LAN parties, and she would make food, and you know, help organize the event. And it was just a really sweet, but surprising. Like, we think that's surprising, right? Like, of course a parent would, like, you know, drive their kids to soccer and, like, do the soccer banquet. But, you know, here's a parent who's just treating gaming just like any other thing that their son loves to do. And, in fact, that was actually highly unusual. Uh, kids went, like, there was one teen who was actually a professional gamer, and their parent, his parents didn't know about it. So kids went to great lengths to sort of hide and sequester their gaming identities because they knew that their parents disapproved. So as educators, what can we do to create environments that really bridge that disconnect, that actively create environments where kids are going to be able to find learning heroes who are not just their peers, but also uh, caring adults, uh, mentors in the community, and so on. So I wanted to share the case, a story of Tal, who was 11 at the time that uh, we spoke to her. She's a Minecraft fan. And she started playing Minecraft at home, which is fairly typical of kids. She has a cousin who is really into it. Uh, and, uh, you know, what was unique about Tal's experience is she was a student at Quest to Learn, which uh, many of you may know is a school that embraces games uh, in learning. And when the kids asked to start a Minecraft school uh, club at school, the school said, sure, of course. Uh, and like other Minecraft kids, Tal also watches a ton of Minecraft YouTube videos and decided that she wanted to try making a Minecraft YouTube video. And then she brought it to the club. They were like, yeah, and she started making scripts. Uh, and they did, had a great time, made some really cool stuff. They got celebrated by the school. She was interviewed for the school paper. And so when you look at uh, Tal's learning, she started with the passionate interest, which is Minecraft. She had supportive relationships in the home, but also at school that was supporting the interests and also guiding those interests into new areas like writing and um, you know, collaboration and teamwork. And the, that connection to opportunity that happened because it was a learning environment that embraced uh, these kinds of student interests, that was actually really unusual. Uh, so, Tal is an example of what we call a connected learner, which in a nutshell is learning that uh, unites interests with uh, supportive relationships and is tied to opportunity, whether that's civic, career, or academic opportunity. Uh, and you know, we, we're not saying that all learning has to be connected learning all the time. Uh, kids 
Uh, there are times when kids have to learn things they're not interested in, and there are times when kids should just be able to play and muck around with their friends and not have it be tied to learning. Like, we don't want to colonize all their fun with the learning stuff, but we do believe that le connected learning is a critically important and qualitatively different kind of learning because it's learning that's tied to uh, your deepest identity, interests, and affiliations being recognized in the wider world. It's the kind of learning that helps young people discover who they are and find their place in the world. And that's why we believe that all young people deserve to have the experience of connected learning. Now, the moral of the story for Tal is not that the internet creates connected learners or Quest to Learn connects, connect, creates connected learners, but in fact, most young people's environments are disconnected. They're struggling to connect the learning in home to the learning in school, even when <clears throat> they may have an interest, like in Minecraft, that they're pursuing at home. They may have some community-based uh, organizations or a special summer camp that supports that interest. The ties to school and to career are generally pretty weak. Uh, and part of the reason for this is when we think about learning, we often uh, ha think about it as a pipeline where our goal is like to get kids, like get up one more um, step in the pipeline. And if, they keep, if we keep them in the pipeline, eventually they'll get a job and be super successful. Now, what really happens looks more like this, especially when you're talking about fields like we're in, like creative, technical fields, uh, you know, fields characterized by fast-paced change that, in fact, people who are successful have a whole web of relationships in the family, uh, through their professional networks, in the community that support them and are kind of this protective web that keep them engaged. Now, the formal pipeline is obviously incredibly important, but, uh, you know, what's it's this connective tissue that is often invisible that really supports young people in persisting uh, in these areas. So I want to, I'm hoping you'll indulge me in just one last uh, community poll here uh, to get a sense of the social networks that have brought all of you to this room today. Uh, so I assume this is the majority of people in the room, but I'd like you to stand up if you are working in a games or technical, technology-related field. Okay, yeah, most of you. Okay, so stay standing, stay standing, uh, but I want you to sit down if you grew up with a parent or guardian who was in a tech-related field. Yeah, everybody else stay standing. Okay, I would say about over half sat down. Okay, now stay standing, but sit down if uh, you had a parent or guardian who was supportive of your interests in games. Oh, interesting. Wow, you guys have amazing parents. I would say half the people who were still standing had supportive parents. Okay, so still stay standing, but uh, sit down if you had a teacher or mentor as you were growing up who was supportive of your interest in games. Okay, very interesting. So look around the room. There's very few people standing, right? So most people are in a games-related field or technology-related field. Um, but these are the folks who got to this field without you know, a lot of the immediate personal supports that many of us had. I would include myself in that. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so I think we, those folks deserve a special hand for making it against the odds. All of us deserve a special hand for making it into this very um, unique field that uh, I think does require a lot of uh, commitment, personal commitment, but also a lot of uh, social support in order to, to, get, <clears throat> to get there. Um, so this issue of social capital or social supports is particularly important when we think of issues of equity. So a lot of folks are probably pretty aware that 
Uh, there's an equity gap when it comes to formal education. What tends to get a little less attention is the equity gap in informal education. So here's a graph that shows uh, the difference in investments of the wealthiest families in this country and the poorest, where the wealthiest families, the wealthiest fifth, have tripled their investments in out-of-school enrichment from about $3,000 to almost $8,000 per child per year, where poor families had stayed at about $1,000 a year. Uh, and this is really testament to the fact that families are realizing that more and more it's this informal learning, uh, the specialized learning, whether it's the violin lessons or the sports clubs or whatever your kid is interested in, that they find their identity, their interests, their people, that they uh, get these experiences of really getting good at something and making contributions to a community. Uh, you put this alongside the decline of investments in school, poor schools for enrichment activities, and that equity gap is really massive. Uh, so I want to end just by, um, you know, uh, you know, closing with a few examples of ways in which uh, educators and activists can engage in this space, because without our involvement, uh, we are in an environment where the rich get richer, where we already know that young kids who are well supported and activated, they have superpowers in this environment. I mean, they can start learning calculus when they're 10. They can save the world a couple times before high school. I mean, it's just an amazing ecosystem for kids who have those supports. But we also know that those opportunities are being distributed quite unequally because there aren't strong connections to our communities, to our learning organizations, to parents across all walks of life. So connected learning is not only a way of describing learning, but also a set of principles for how we can support learning. Uh, and I'll walk through some of these design principles very quickly through three, through two examples of projects that I'm lucky enough to be involved in that are um, designed around the principles of connected learning, which is really about building connections across interests and opportunities and across a broader learning ecosystem. So the first one is NACEF, the North American Scholastic Esports Federation, and there will be a session uh, later today that's specifically focused on this, uh, that Constance Steinkuhler and Gerald Solomon and uh, Tom Turner, for, who have been leading this effort, will be talking about. So I encourage you to go to that if you want to learn more about it. But in a nutshell, it's a high school esports league that is school sponsored. So yes, the kids are already there, but the school is sponsoring it. So that's the cornerstone of this intervention. Uh, esports, shared purpose, no brainer. Competitive play is a great way to generate a sense of shared purpose. Um, but the, uh, the league is also very committed to production-oriented activities, so bringing kids into different forms of engagement, teaching shoutcasting, the marketing, the entrepreneurship side of things, um, including a high school curriculum around that, uh, which relates to the final principle is multiple pathways. It shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all model. Sure, you can be a competitive player, but you can also be somebody who is writing blog posts or shooting videos or shoutcasting or doing analysis. And giving multiple opportunities for kids to find their identity in a community is critically important. Uh, the last example I'll share is Connected Camps, which is a nonprofit that Katie Salen uh, and Tara Brown and I started several years ago, which is really about building um, and developing a network of teenage uh, high school and college counselors who are gaming nerds and tech experts to work with younger kids in an online project-based format. Uh, we started with Minecraft as our environment. Again, it's about meeting kids where they are. Uh, it was you know, the most popular game for the kids in our age group, uh, and we wanted to provide an environment that would validate that. We could calm parents down that our server was safe, but the kids were still able to do the things they loved. Uh, and of course, Minecraft is production-centered, enough said. Uh, and then our counselors really provide a unique kind of shared purpose to frame the passions that the kids already have, whether that's through build challenges, game design, uh, teaching kids that if they program turtles, they can do extra cool stuff in Minecraft. Uh, so really, that's the uh, secret sauce of 
our programs is it's a membership model and the kids can drop into these labs where there's always a counselor there to help them with projects and to design group challenges. Uh, you know, and again, multiple pathways. It's not only you know, game design, but we have coding, we have creative lab, we have survival lab, and we have camps and you know, theater and all these other, these varied interests that kids can uh, explore through Minecraft. So I'm about out of time here, but the one last ask I have of you uh, is, you know, remember that learning hero who you talked about with your partner a few minutes ago? Uh, do they know the influence that they've had in your life? Um, so before the day ends, you could do it right now even. I just, one favor I ask is let your learning hero know. Even if they've already, they know that they're awesome, they don't, wouldn't mind hearing again. Uh, send them a text, send them an email, give them a call, tweet out, because uh, it's really about this ecosystem of all of us having a contribution to make uh, in supporting, sponsoring, uh, and enabling connected learning for young people. So there's lots more resources around connected learning at the Connected Learning Alliance site. We're running our annual conference at the MIT Media Lab in early uh, August. Uh, we'd love to have you there. And I think I have time for maybe one or two questions, uh, if anybody, or a comment. Yeah. It is quite difficult to ensure that they're able to bring some of these concepts home. They just don't have the, they don't even, they don't have the equipment. Uh -huh. They don't have, you know, oftentimes they don't have any of the, they don't have a cell phone or anything. So yeah, I guess, what would you have any insight on how we can do that um, to lend them that support? Yeah, at home. Yeah, that's a huge issue, and I think one of the challenges uh, that. I mean, I would just put out to the community, because I know a lot of folks here are also developing the technology, is that while it's really great to be innovating and pursuing the latest technology, one of the things that's really important to think about is, like, what kids are you excluding by always building on high-end platforms? So. I, it's not something that I had time to get into today, but we've been doing uh, various studies that are really about this um, equity gap in educational technologies precisely for the reasons that you're describing is that, you know, innovators tend to want to, like even something as simple as streaming video is a hu becomes a huge um, digital divide if it's expected that kids are able to access that from home. So there are programs that are you know, trying to build infrastructure to address that issue, but I think what you're describing is unfortunately a kind of endemic to some of how innovation happens within this space is that you know, the funding and the innovation tends to flow towards platforms that you know, a lot of kids by nature, you know, just by definition, because it's an arms race, will not have at home. And so, you know, for the esports project, for example, you know, creating uh, spaces, after school spaces within the school, because a lot of the kids, you know, they, they didn't have league at home. They didn't have computers that they could do esports at home for our lower income schools. And so the school then ends up having to bear the burden of providing the, that equipment and that space, which you know, I know it's not a very helpful answer, but it's the realistic one, probably. Yeah. Um, I'll, is it on? Yeah, okay. Uh, you were talking a lot about affinity groups, and I was just wondering how similar you were finding the affinity groups to Augenberg's third spaces. I'm sorry, can uh, you say that? The, the affinity groups that you're uh -huh. studying, how have you seen any similarities between them and third spaces, online oh, uh -huh. third spaces? Yeah, so I think a lot of, there are similarities in the sense of kind of safety and welcomingness for the good ones. I mean, there's a lot of affinity networks that are kind of nasty affinity networks too, which we didn't study. Um, but I think what's, uh, possibly different about affinity networks from the 
you know, what I know of the classic kind of third space literature is that they're very specialized around a particular interest or affinity rather than about being sort of more of an open place-based community. Um, so I think I'm probably over time. So just one last question, Bronwyn, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think, the question was about esports and gender, and as far as I know, like, it's not a place that is on its way to becoming gender neutral slash more inclusive, uh, and I think it's, um, you know, I think it's one of those questions, uh, I didn't get to talk about the dark side of affinity networks, but it's actually endemic to the model because if kids are learning and bonding based on a sense of shared identity and affinity, it also creates a very exclusionary environment for kids who don't fit that identity. And there's different ways you can address it, and there's some affinity networks that you can tweak to be more inclusive along different vectors without breaking the culture. I think the jury's still out on esports, quite frankly, about whether that's even an environment that is really amenable to that. Or the other um, approach is just to proliferate the number of uh, interest areas so that, that we recognize as valid. So rather than trying to get a One Direction kid to play StarCraft, why don't we validate One Direction fandoms and girly fandoms as like just as awesome and technologically cutting edge and all of those things. So I think there's a strategic differences in how one might look at it. I do think that the, the, we have this desire to say, oh, well, you know, there should be more boys in One Direction fandom and there should be more girls in StarCraft. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's just pragmatically a really challenging thing. Um, on the other hand, you look at something like Minecraft, which does have a greater participation of girls, and so that's the environment that I've been focusing on to try to bring more girls in because girls are already participating, and then you can sort of create safer spaces. So we'll run summer camps that are girls only, coding camps in Minecraft, because they're already into Minecraft, they're a little bit intimidated by coding. We found that throwing them into a boy-dominated coding camp can often turn them off. So creating like nudges where they already are rather than sort of whole scale like swim with the wolves seems like um, just a strategy that we've been exploring. But it's hard, it's a hard question. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry to have run over. <laughs> yeah.